Good evening. Let me call to order the regular City Council meeting for the City of St. Helena for August 22, 2017. Uh, we're beginning at 6.15 because the Council just concluded a two-hour session that began at 4 and we needed a little break. And so thank you very much for uh, bearing with us. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Ellsworth. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Councilmember Doring? Here. Ellsworth? Here. Coberstein? Here. Vice Mayor White? Here. Mayor Galbraith? Here. Uh, that takes us to public forum. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on matters of municipal concern. Time limit is no more than three minutes, uh, and it has to relate to matters not on our agenda this evening. Yes, please. Are we on? Good evening. I'm Conrad Baldwin. I was at your last meeting, and I brought you a copy of my book, The Boy Generation. Uh, which I suppose you, you have all had a chance to look at now. And I'm sure you're as shocked and disturbed as I am about the size of this scandal, how thousands of African Americans and Hispanic citizens were thrown into jail, and many of them are still there for allegedly violating restraining orders that didn't tell them what they couldn't do. And as you s could see from the information that I also brought you, this was actually a racist plot by staff from the California Judicial Council. Uh, this is not a, an accident. It was a deliberate attempt to uh, in incriminate African Americans and Hispanics, and it's still going on. Uh, I have brought you some information today, a copy of a resolution that I would hope you would send to Governor Brown, ordering them or asking him to order these people freed. Uh, it also tells you some of the laws that uh, you're required to, to follow in this situation. And uh, also, there's uh, hopefully uh, enough in the, in the documents that I've also given you the articles from the Oakland Post and the review from the California uh, Attorneys for Criminal Justice uh, that will tell you that this is not a hoax. This is a real serious problem. Um, we will be, hopefully, uh, and I have uh, good advice, we will be getting a lot of support from the Hispanic community here in, the t in town through people like the uh, uh, County Care Center and the local Catholic Church. Uh, and we hope to have a lot of people then calling you in and supporting you in your decision to send this resolution to the governor. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm continuing to have a conversation with Mr. Baldwin and should have a more of a report soon, too. All right. Uh, Mr. Belt? Yes. Uh, Tom Belt, Hillview Place, St. Lena. Mm -hmm. Good evening, uh, council members and city staff. Um, a few weeks ago, there was an article in the St. Lena Star that addressed one of the reasons, one of the reasons why our city council voted three to two not to provide disclosure about the costs and qu quantities of water serviced to 28 water contract customers. That reason was because two of our, our council members felt it would bring shame on those customers. Tonight, in my three minutes, I'd, I'd like to request that the city council reconsider that vote and I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why I think that should be reconsidered. The first reason is that the city already disclosed the fact that 28 water contract customers can purchase up to 521 acre feet of water a year from our enterprise. Since that disclosure, I haven't heard or read about anyone trying to shame these 28 water customers for the water they're contracted to receive. The potential for shame only exists, in my opinion, with the city if it is not monitoring the quantity of service or the correct billing for the water provided. The very fact that 28 water customers equal 1% of the total number of customers in our water enterprise and that the 521 acre feet represents 26% of the annual safe yield of our water, um, that in itself should be enough, in my opinion, to provide the transparency needed that the city's record keeping and public records are being kept accurately. Again, uh, and then uh, in addition to that, earlier this year, the city announced it settled a litigation case in which one of the 28 water customers, contract customers, I should say, hadn't paid the total amount of money it was owed for past due water 
over a multi-year period of time. In that settlement, <laughs> that our water enterprise had not billed the customer correctly according to the terms of the contract. And our city ended up settling for a fraction of what it was owed for the water. And to make matters worse, when I asked the city how much it paid the attorney to settle the case, I was told that it was privileged information. When in fact the Public Records Act says when a settlement has been set settled, when, when a case has been settled, that information should be provided. I came away feeling if the city has not been billing the contract customer correctly, how many other contract customers are not being billed correctly? In May of this year, I asked permission to review the city's water contracts. I was given an hour to read as much information as I could, and at that time I discovered that one of the, water, the current water contract customers could receive up to 74.6 million gallons of water on an annual basis for free. And that was based upon appropriate water rights that existed in Bell Creek back in 1960. The interesting, about, interesting thing about the water contract was that it, it, it supposedly expired upon the death of the, and I'll, give me one more minute please, right. it expired on the death of the uh, contract holder. I asked the uh, water conservation officer at the time if the city was still providing water to that contract customer for free and I was told she did not know. Um, I since it subsequently put in a public records request to get that information, and I'm still not told how much or even if there is free water being given to that water customer after the contract expired. In summary, in an effort to improve upon the public trust we have in our city's management, the disclosure of this kind of public information should be provided to the people who live and pay their bills to the city. The way the Adams Street development was recently handled, the way our utility rates have skyrocketed close to 200% over the last 10 years, the unaccounted, one, unaccounted for $1.9 million that couldn't be accounted for, all these examples and many more are all reasons the city needs to be upfront and transparent about how our city is being managed. And I would again ask you to reconsider that vote. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we certainly had a thorough discussion of this issue. Uh, uh, last time, uh, and I would ask any interested members of the public to review that discussion, including specifically applicable state law. Uh, any further uh, public comment? All right, uh, that would take us to uh, reports by staff and city council, future agenda items, and AB 1234 reports. Uh, let me start with the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Well, uh, just, just concluded the third week. Uh, this week is the fourth week on the job, so I uh, very much appreciate it being here. I've had an opportunity to hold three meet and greets throughout town. I think that was mentioned at our last meeting. And this past week had a chance to spend time with Vineyard Valley and enjoyed the, the time in the afternoon uh, with residents there. I want to take an opportunity to yield the rest of my time briefly to uh, introduce Chief Bill Imboden, who is going to share with you and introduce to you uh, our volunteer program. Oh, all right. Uh, Chief Imboden. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, Council, I appreciate the, the time. I know it's not um, spelled out on the agenda. I'm kind of hijacking this. Um, but we just finished our, uh, our we sixth... We don't allow you to hijack. You're a police officer. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But we always give you time. We just finished our six-week uh, training session for our first Volunteer and Police Services Academy. Um, and as you know, uh, you approved this, uh, this academy uh, to bring some volunteers in to help us uh, with some of the, the things that we have going on that we might not always have the time to get to. And so um, uh, they come in and they take some of the burden off of us. In addition to that, they, they come in and uh, provide us with a lot of their expertise and, uh, and just bring a lot of value to the department. It also helps us... Uh, you know, stay in touch with the community that we're trying to serve. So appreciate the, the, the support. I wanted to bring them up uh, one at a time. I, I know several of them have family here, um, and I wanted to present them with uh, their certificates of graduation, if that's all right. Absolutely. Uh, so if I could have uh, Rick Broyles come on up. Oops, how do you stand in front? I'm not, I'll bring them all up at the same time. So uh, Rick, um, so Mike Burns. Uh, Perry Butler, K. 
Ken Dowswell and George Watson, if you could come up. We have one more volunteer who was not able to be here because she's taking a test in her administration of justice classes at the Napa Valley College. Okay. These are our five of our first six volunteers. They'll be working for you. They'll be working with us. And uh, we appreciate your service. Uh, uh, to paraphrase a quote, um, the volunteers are, are not paid, but they are priceless. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Mitz? I have nothing to report tonight. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, Ms. Camaro? Nothing to report, Mayor. Mr. House, you've already done a lot of speaking. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to report one thing. The City was able to issue the Turley Flats building permit yesterday, so that project I do anticipate uh, demolition to uh, start on that property, which is 1105 Pope Street, uh, the m Tuesday after Labor Days, according to the construction schedule provided to me. So the building permits issued. We have begun uh, assisting with some of the funding that was committed by the council, and uh, they do have a construction schedule they're starting to move forward with. Okay, terrific. Uh, Mr. Yorby? Okay. Good evening. I'm sitting in for Erica. Yeah. Uh, just one quick thing to report. Uh, the uh, I was able to actually contact Ross Recreation regarding... Oh, wait, wait just a minute. Uh, let's see what they're... <coughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, regarding the, uh, the Beltway Swing at Crane Park, and so we are moving forward with replacing that with a clatter-style bridge and then upgrading, updating our uh, signage. Okay, terrific. So. All right. Um, Ms. Coberstein? Uh, Mr. Ellsworth? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a flyer in the back for a National Geographic documentary called Water and Power about uh, water use in California. It, focuses more on the Central Valley and Paso Robles, but we have, we're in a similar agricultural area. And I think the, the film addresses water security concerns, water access concerns. So it, I think it's worth watching. It's the, the link is on the, the card. Um, the more educated we all are on, on water use, uh, uh, it's an important resource for us. So uh, the more we all know, the better. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Doring? I have nothing. Thank you. What? Nothing. Thank you. Uh, uh, the mayor has nothing either. Uh, so uh, the next item on our agenda is a proclamation. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can find it here. And I would ask all members of the city council to stand behind me uh, as I read the proclamation, if that's appropriate. All right, thank you. Uh, proclamation supporting an end to hate, bigotry, and intimidation in all its forms. Whereas acts of hate, bigotry, and intimidation have become much too frequent and even daily occurrences and are increasing at epidemic rates across our nation. Whereas such acts of hate, bigotry, and intimidation incite fear in those members of the targeted group. Whereas history has tragically taught us what happens when people complacently stand by and permit acts of hate, bigotry, and intimidation to occur. Whereas people often feel isolated, dispirited, and helpless to do anything individually to end acts of hate, bigotry, and intimidation. Whereas such acts run contrary to the principles of respect, dignity, and fairness that the St. Helena community values. Whereas diversity, tolerance, and inclusiveness have long been hallmarks of the St. Helena community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city 
St. Helena City Council stands together with all people of goodwill across the nation to push back against the upsurge in hate-motivated behavior and strongly condemn such behavior in all forms. And be it further resolved that the city, that the St. Helena City Council commits to helping to create a community in which the humanity and dignity of every person is respected, nurtured, and preserved. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the city of St. Helena pledges to be vigilant in defense of the rights of all people, proactive in our attempts to be a welcoming and inclusive community for all, and steadfast and vigorous in condemning all forms of hate and bigotry, dated August 22, 2017. Thank you very much. these microphones. That takes us to our consent agenda. Uh, and as usual, I will read off the items. And then if any member of the public or council wishes to withdraw an item from consent, please let me know. And then we'll go through uh, uh, the normal process. 8.1, 2016-2017 uh, annual report on the housing services agreement with the Housing Authority of the City of Napa. 8.2, Memorandum of Understanding between the City of St. Helena and the St. Helena Hospital, with the St. Helena Hospital committing to provide health care services to low-income individuals without Medicare or the State of California Medicaid benefits. 8.3, Consideration and Proposed Approval of a Resolution Approving Agreement with the Housing Authority of the City of Napa to administer the Home Grant Funded Owner Occupied Rehabilitation Program 8.4, consideration of proposed approval resolution authorizing the police department to accelerate the hiring of one police officer effective November 1st, 2017, in advance of an, un of an announced officer retirement in February 2018. 8.5, consideration of approval resolution authorizing the city manager to sign a joint contract between the city of St. Helena and the city of Calistoga with the Up Valley Family Centers to provide state-mandated juvenile diversion services not to exceed $25,000 annually. At this point, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Second. Um, Ms. Camaro. For the record, uh, would you please clarify uh, uh, the Mr. second Ellsworth, motion? Because he was closer to me. Uh, <laughs> you heard Got to my first. ear first. <laughs> Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council Member Ellsworth? Yes. Coberstein? Yes. Doring? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Okay, that takes us to, uh, we have no public hearings, that takes us to new business. The first item is review, discuss, and provide direction to staff and Hansford Economic Consulting on revised utility rate study. Uh, and this is a situation which uh, staff is seeking direction on several specific items uh, and uh, Let's see, I suppose our, our staff person is Ms. Mitz, Mr. Uh, Prestwich. We're both. sharing responsibility tonight. All right. I'm going to take an opportunity to begin tonight, Mayor. I know this is a very important issue for the community. And uh, also myself getting up to speed on this particular issue. Um, this week experienced um, a situation where I felt it would be um, much, much more helpful to seek additional clarification on uh, ongoing efforts to uh, present the council with some modified rate uh, numbers for the utility rates, options for the council to consider moving forward. And tonight, um, we have really three goals. Uh, these three goals are to absolutely ensure that there's clarity, uh, that the council staff and our consultant, HEC, uh, have alignment on the next steps with respect to the ongoing analysis. We want to seek clarification on five issues that um, 
Finance Director Mitz will walk through with you. Uh, we also have Catherine Hansford with HEC available to answer questions related to the ongoing work. And finally, we want to confirm and walk through um, a calendar with you on anticipated dates and milestones related to the utility rate adjustments moving forward. So with that, uh, let me introduce Finance Director Mitz. Thank you. The five items that we are seeking clarification on tonight, um, we've broken out into a table where we have where we need clarification or direction, staff's recommendations, as well as the rationale behind those recommendations. So the first is simply a language update. The classifications currently have motels with food and motels without food. And after working with Catherine Hansford, we are making the recommendation that it be changed to lodging with restaurant and lodging without restaurant because we don't actually have any motels within the city, so that is strictly a language update. The second item that we would like to, um, some clarification on and some direction is mixed retail with food is currently a category that we have. We would like to change that or we're making the recommendation to change it to mixed retail one to three units, mixed retail four units and over. Uh, the rationale behind this is just to keep it, to simplify it, as well as uh, the usage for accounts with more businesses, you, they use the system more. So we wanted to try to find a good way to actually break that down. The third item is non-residential for the sake of space. I put NR. So non-residential wastewater use. The direction by city council on June 19th was to change that to annual average as opposed to winter average. We are making the recommendation to change non-residential water use back to actual use. So that's what it was before we adopted the rates last year. A few reasons for this. Um, one is reduced staff time and actually making the, the computations for it. And it also is reducing the risk of error for those computations. The uh, One of the other reasons is that if you take the annual average and actual use, you come up to pretty close the same, the same number. So we felt like we were duplicating our efforts. And then the third reason is it does tie into item number four as well, um, where we can charge for the actual use of, of the water, and, uh, I'm sorry, of the wastewater going into our system. So the fourth item is regarding uh, the how wine, wineries are classified. Currently in the rate models, it's classified, and these are the actual titles, winery production, parentheses, Maryvale, Spotswood, and then Sutter Home Winery. So we really want to clean that up. The notion behind those two were actually pre-treated and non-treated uh, wastewater going into the system. So we are making the recommendation that they, those are changed to winery pre-treated, winery non-treated, and actually taking the winery name out of there. Um, the rationale, it is a cleanup of existing language. Additionally, how it ties into item number three is that staff, since the implementation of the last rate study, we've and it's mentioned, it's outlined in the staff report, several wineries are actually putting more water into the wastewater system that we were actually anticipating. Right now it's about an average of about 2% is what we're calculating they're putting into the wastewater system. Based on their actual numbers we've been able to get from them because they use well water in a lot of instances, it's closer to 6%. Wow. So currently staff, we are we're going to continue working with these wineries, potentially coming to city council later on actually installing meters to actually track what is going into our system. So with the change in number three, it would actually allow us to charge them actually for what is going down to the wastewater system. So those that's how those two tie in together. And then the final council direction is the Right now, the council direction is that November 2017 is the next scheduled rate increase under the current model. Our recommendation is postponing that, and the rationale is with the postponement of it, working with Catherine, working with city council, we are anticipating we can get the new rates into effect by the 12-8 billing cycle. So that is one billing cycle later. We have confirmed with Catherine, as well as the municipal finance advisor, that would not put our bond covenants at risk. And so um, that is our, our recommendation for that item. Uh, the next slide, I am going to turn this back over to Mark to talk about the timeline. 
So this, this timeline's a little bit different than what I believe the council was anticipating um, a couple of months ago. It shifts by one month, and that's partly to ensure that we have the availability of uh, our consultant available to answer questions when information is presented to the council. So this week, we had an opportunity to work with Catherine Hansford and identify a date that she would be available. I know, uh, I believe at the last meeting, we indicated that she wasn't available on September 12th the City Council's next meeting. However, if uh, calendars work for the City Council, she is available um, the meeting of September 18th. And in talking this through um, regarding the direction that we're seeking tonight, as well as time necessary to produce these alternatives for you to take a look at, we anticipate uh, being able to receive and publish rate model options for you on September 11th. This would provide the council and the community with a week uh, of time to look at those numbers and to provide feedback on the meeting of September 18th. Uh, following that would be a, on the meeting of September 26th. The city council would have an opportunity to select the new rates. Uh, we've noted a milestone date here that's important to keep in, um, in consideration. That's the date of October 6th when the Proposition 218 notice uh, deadline is uh, set for mailing. Uh, the Council can take action at any meeting between now and November uh, to postpone rates should you um, uh, move forward with that recommendation. We've identified October 10th as a date for that because that follows the discussion that you would have regarding the various rate options. And then formally adopting the rates, uh, really this can occur any time between the 21st of November or the 30th of November. We've simply identified the date of the, the second meeting in November, which is November 28th, for the date would you, when you would formally adopt the new rates. And we would align the implementation of the utility rates with our meter reads, and that would occur on, on December 8th, 2017. And as... Um, the finance director indicated uh, we've received assurance that this would not affect the bond covenants. And uh, with that, uh, let us pause for any questions you have. And uh, Catherine Hansford is available to help us answer questions, uh, ensure that there's absolute clarity on the steps we're taking moving forward. And we look forward to your questions. All right. Um, are there any initial questions from the council before I open the public hearing? Or should we open the public hearing first and then go back to the... All right. And let me open it up for the, for the public hearing, and then we'll go back to questions, including any to you, uh, Ms. Hansford. Does anybody want to speak at public hearing with respect to these uh, specific uh, five items? My name is Pat Dell. I live in St. Helena. I'll preclude what I'm going to say by saying that I attended every single one of the meetings having to do with this issue uh, since last uh, November. When I attended the meeting on June 19th, I thought it was made pretty clear to Ms. Mitz that this was a time-sensitive issue. And I see that she and staff, I don't never know what that means, um, have opted to go ahead with some parts of the study, some additional parts of the study that I don't think anyone ever authorized them to. Um, it's very hard for the public who's concerned about something to see an unconscionable change in what they expected to what's actually happening. I just want to make a couple of comments from the report. Um, page 93, item, complete winery on-site visit city and determine wastewater discharge for each city. It is anticipated staff will have this to HEC by August 16th. And I wrote, who authorized this? I don't, I don't know. I never heard about it. And a little further, it says the analysis remains on an aggressive time schedule. If this has been aggressive, I'd sure hate to see moderate or slow, because this has not seemed at all aggressive to me. And then it drops down. It, it mentions here that um, there will be meetings held and would need to take place between October 28th and October 30th. 
for adoption of the new rates if less than a 50% protest is received. Are we going to have to do this again? I mean, the public has been through this. We've done our protests. We've organized our meetings. We've done our petition. And yet, we wait. And I don't understand it. I mean, maybe this winery business that you're doing is good. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying nobody said you should do it, and now everything is held up. Um, while examining this particular classification, I'm on page 95, was not part of the direction received on June 19th. And again, I've said this, so I'll say it again. Who, who gave, you should have had council permission to do that. And I pretty much pay attention to all council meetings, and I never heard any other discussion. So in closing, I certainly hope that schedule is carved in stone, and, and I hope you're going to be able to go forward and, um, you know, not disappoint the public anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Mark Smithers, uh, Vallejo Street, St. Helena. I, I do have to say that when I first read the staff report, I was a bit disappointed in the lack of progress given the 12 items that uh, the council had directed staff to, to proceed with. And I was thinking that, you know, certainly two months would have been enough time. I, I am quite pleased and I, I feel good about the new schedule and milestones and I, I'm, I'm, I applaud the fact that we now looks like we've tightened it up and we're not going to stray off left or right. We're going to work on the things that we're supposed to work on to finish up the process so that we can get to, you know, the, the, the new rates. Um, I do want to make sure, though, that I'm, I'm clear that it says City Council proposes November rate adjustments. One of the 12 items, I think was number 11, was that we, we were going to, or the City Council, or the City was going to adopt the modified rate structure. So I, I, I'm, I'm confident, or I hope I'm confident and right in the fact that we're not going to stray from that decision. Um, because that was a very, very big decision that impacted a lot of things with regards to the wastewater. Um, so that, that's one issue. And then the other concern or question I have, and, it, and this delay is, I think, making it more difficult, but, and it wasn't one of the 12 items, but what was discussed and what really precipitated the whole committee was the fact that people were getting charged, you know, these very different rates than what they got charged before and that I thought that there was going to be some sort of retroactive adjustments to these folks that are paying out thousands of dollars when they were used to paying out a couple hundred dollars and then going back and rejiggering and going to the new rate structure that that would happen, that there would be billings to some and there would be refunds to others and I, I haven't heard any discussion of that and so as we get further down the road and many more months past you know, it gets harder and harder and harder to bill people for something. It's easy to refund people, but it's pretty hard to bill people. So I don't know where you guys are on, on that issue, but um, I'm really happy that it looks like we've got a definitive calendar here, and I'm, I'm confident that Mark and his team will, you know, follow through on this, and we'll all be in good shape come December. So, Thank you very much, Mr. Smithers. Any further Thank public you. comment? All right, let me close uh, public comment. Uh, uh, perhaps staff could address first, uh, is the modified rate structure in the model that you plan to use? Ms. Hansford? Yes, in the 2016 rate study we did, um, I'll just, if I could just start out with, the, the original scope of services was for a cost of service study and to come back with recommended rate structures. So in 2016, that's what we did, and we came back to the ad hoc committee with two different rate structures. One was this modified rate structure, which was <clears throat> very similar to the rate structure that was already in place. Um, it just had... Um, a slight difference in some of the categories. I think, for example, the religious places was broken out on its own. Um, so just a few um, small minor changes. And the other one was the uh, rate structure that was uh, actually adopted last year. So yes, we have the rate model 
available that we can update. Okay, good. And then with respect to the, quote, retroactive adjustments, uh, that really goes to the fact that the City Council undertook to expand uh, uh, the, um, the subsidy program from the general fund. Uh, very complicated process we went through. Uh, and we did include businesses with a cutoff date, as I recall it, and that, that was all done with much discussion uh, in the past uh, two or three months. So let me just begin. Uh, is there any further council discussion uh, uh, of, of the specific issues? Uh, maybe we should just take them one at a time. Uh, one is motels with food, motels without food, change to lodging with restaurant lodging without restaurant. That just seems to be a language change. Does anybody have a problem with that? Okay. Number two is mixed retail with food going to mixed retail, one to three units, mixed retail, four units and over. The word food gets deleted. Maybe there could be a little bit more conversation around that. Uh, oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Just jumped up. Yes. Um, <clears throat> What we did was we had a good look at these accounts, and we talked to city staff about it. Um, these are accounts where there are multiple businesses being served off of one water meter. And some of these accounts, um, some of the accounts that were mixed retail with food actually didn't serve any food at all and should be in a different category. And then the um, businesses that have food they're not just restaurants. There's also, for example, a bakery. Um, and so these are businesses that have similar wastewater strength, so the um, similar characteristics, but the volume can be very different depending on whether that meter serves one to three units or if it serves more than three units, three units just being a business, for example. Um, so that's why we recommend splitting out into those two different categories. Okay, good. And the, the units refers to units of water? The units are the businesses. So, for okay. example, you might have a bakery next to um, an olive oil place or a hair salon or something like that. So you might have truly a retail business and you might have a restaurant. But, um, for example, the bakery produces wastewater that's of a strength. It's very similar to a restaurant. So it's not serving... Uh, restaurant food, but it's right. similar nature. Well, one of the one of the businesses that that got hit with a very large increase uh, was in the mixed retail with food, and um, I think they had a fairly low water use. So I just want to make sure that that um, there's some graduated uh, for somebody who uses less. So that, that, and that is the idea of splitting out between one to three units and then more than three units. Because that there is a large difference in volume. Okay. All right. Um, let me turn to three, which is uh, non-residential. I, I paused over the word NR. <laughs> non-residential water usage, annual average <clears throat> versus non-residential water usage, uh, actual use. Uh, uh, my memory is that this uh, came out of the second ad hoc committee uh, and I thought it was a terrific recommendation myself, but uh, is there any further discussion on this one? Mm -hmm. and, and then how is that measured? Is it by meter? Mm -hmm. but by meter, okay. Water meter, yeah. Water meter. Okay, thanks. All right, next one is uh, winery production, Perrin Maryville, Spotswood and Perrin, uh, and then Sutter Home Winery underneath. Winery pre-treated, winery non-treated. Uh, rationale is clean up existing language. I don't think anybody can be against that rationale, uh, but you might want to explain just a little bit what the issue is. So it's um, really best not to name an actual business uh, in, a, in a rate study. It had been that way in the previous rate studies, and it just carried through to this one. Um, <clears throat> so it's much better just to call them wineries whether they're pre-treated pre or non-treated. Uh, like we had said, we still have just a little bit more investigation to do with one of the wineries. Um, it is possible that all of the wineries end up being in a pre-treated category. There may not be any in a non-treated category. Um, but just so we uh, clear that up, just so that we're not naming a specific winery. All right. And then... The I have some comments uh, about this one. Sure. Um, 
I take it that what we're doing is we're enabling Catherine to set the cost figures for pre-treated versus non-treated. And I was under the impression reading the staff report that there might actually be two different levels of pre-treatment going on. And so my question was, um, should the rate model, should you develop three different cost figures on the 100 cubic foot thing um, so that we're actually, you know, hitting people yep. who might have a, quite a big differential between uh, their level of treatment? I think, I think that could well be the case. And I would certainly need input from um, a public works director or maybe some other professional that the city provides in terms of that, those strength parameters. I have, I have literature which uh, guided us with the strength parameters that we have currently in the model. But you're absolutely right. There's different levels of treatment. Um, and if, if it's determined that one level of treatment is very different from another in terms of what is then being uh, sent down to the sewer treatment plant, then yes, I do think that the rate model should reflect that. Yeah, I don't, I don't want us to get uh, bogged down in this, uh, you know, at the expense of everything else we have to do. It, it seems that we could come up with some cost figures, and then we can figure out who's in what category by the time we have to send out the Proposition 218 notice so they know, you know, what their cost is going to be. The, the larger issue actually is the flow, not mm -hmm. so even so much the strength, right. because more of the cost gets allocated on the flow. Yeah, which is why, uh, you know, I, I applaud the idea of actually metering the wastewater here for several reasons. I mean, it, it was a great uh, recommendation, I think, by Joel Gott. You know, a winery person and a restaurant person, probably some of the biggest, you know, effluent going in into the system. And I view this as a perfect test model. We don't have that many uh, users here, and I would like to see us move to metering them. It would reduce a lot of staff time, uh, a lot of haggling between them uh, and and the city. You know, we would there'd be nothing to argue about, and uh, we wouldn't have to be out measuring and trying to guess what was happening. So I, I would like the council to take that up and see if we can implement something along those lines. To are these the only two wineries that uh, that go into our wastewater plant, or just the only two that were named? These three uh, are the only three wineries three, that that send that send um, water that has been used for production into the system. There are other wineries that have a, a hole off system, and that their water does not go to the sewer at all. Okay, so only three in the in the city and on our system go into the wastewater plant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's, it certainly would be, I think, useful if they were metered uh, on the effluent side. I, uh, so I think it's a very good recommendation from uh, Ms. Coberstein. But at the moment, uh, we're focused on making sure we have the whether we have two or perhaps three categories, and uh, I think that's a a note that. Uh, Mr. Yuruby should be making and review with Ms. Smithies and get back to uh, Ms. Hansford uh, uh, hopefully fairly quickly uh, uh, so that if she needs another level in the rate model, it can be put in there. Have I roughly said that right? I hope. Okay. Uh, and then five is uh, uh, postponing the uh, rate increase that is currently set to go into, November, go into effect in November, postponing it for a month. Uh, legal advice is it does not uh, involve us in violating our lo our bond covenants, uh, and uh, that's always been a principal concern of mine uh, 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 because it impacts us in so many other ways. Uh, but uh, I've got no problem with the postponement myself, if uh, uh, given the le given the, the advice that uh, that uh, we don't have uh, an issue with respect to our bond covenants and the net revenue requirement, particularly. Does anybody else have an issue with that? So it sounds to me like the council's direction is uh, to uh, uh, accept staff recommendations with respect to one through five with the caveat that I mentioned with respect to four in my comments to Mr. Yuruby. Is that where we are? Does that provide you with the direction you need? 
Yes, it does. I do want to provide one point of clarification based on uh, Mark's comments earlier regarding the retro adjustments. Yes. Uh, the adjustments that were authorized by council were just for those small businesses that applied for it. There was uh, never an indication that I received from city council that any other categories were going to be retroed or charged based on what the current, so their current rates are set, the new rates go into place, they go into effect, there's no issuance of refunds or, or, or billing. Again, I don't believe we have the legal parameters to do that, so I just want to provide some clarification. And that was why the, the matter was so urgent, that's why we moved in in the order and fashion that we have. I think it's important uh, for someone on staff to explain that there was a question asked by a, a member of the public regarding why are we going, why do we need to go through the, the Prop 218 process. I think it would be helpful to articulate w the reasoning behind that. I can respond to that, thank you. The reasoning behind it is if the rates are changing in any any way, shape, or form, unless it's unilaterally, let's say what the rate structure is, the current rate structure we have right now, unilaterally we're saying 5% decrease across the board, then we're okay. If there's any type of decrease that's unilaterally the exact same percentage, we do not need to go back through the Prop 218 process. Because we are completely changing the rate structure, by law we have to redo the entire Prop 218 uh, structure with the notices, the 45-day um, right to provide protest against it. So that is the reason why we do have to go back through that process. I dreamed last night that I could repeal Prop 218, but I woke up to reality. <laughs> um, I've got a comment on uh, on the time, the time, uh, the time, uh, the cutoff day that we set. Um, I heard from somebody this week, a, a business downtown that um, uh, had sent a uh, uh, request to, for the abatement program, and, and there was a problem with the postmark on it. Um, and so I'm hoping, I, I believe they're going to uh, uh, send in a, an appeal, uh, but I hope that we can look at that, because I think the I think the primary idea of this was to provide relief. This was this was one one that went up from around forty dollars a month to eight hundred dollars a month. So I think that um, finding a way to uh, address that, even if there's an issue with the postmark, I think uh, it should come up. I hope next week uh, or next meeting, and and I hope that we can address it. Okay. Well. All right. I think that. Could completes our discussion. If you've got the guidance you need, uh, Mr. City Manager, Mr. Presswich. Just want to make sure that uh, all council member questions are answered and we have an opportunity tonight to clarify any other questions that council members may have about um, direction that was provided in June. I have a couple questions. Um, okay. I think we need some clarification on how many rate models we're looking for uh, and what type. Um, and my recollection of what happened on June 19th was we did speak with Ken, who had presented the um, ad hoc committee with what he called his minimal bonding. Uh, and he also said he could get into a layered uh, bonding. And my recollection is that we asked on June 19th that he do that um, so that we could evaluate at least those two options. And I, I think that was the consensus of the council. So I think we're expecting at least two models. Everybody Ms. Han else Ms. Hansford, agree with that? Speak to that. I, I know you're planning to meet with uh, Mr. Deeker and. Yes, I've spoken to Ken. Um, at this point, we have updated the models, so we have incorporated all the updated financial information that the city provided to us. We have also updated all the CIP information that was provided to us. And so we have the models ready to ship off to Ken. And what he will do then is he will look at uh, the best um, bonding to cash um, scenarios that also maintain that uh, debt service coverage ratio and I think the, ca the council direction was between 1.3 to 1.5. Right. So that's what he's going to do. Um, and, uh, and then he will, he will give me that information to put back into the model, and then I would see how that uh, affects the rates. Okay. I'd like us to look at one more thing. Um, I, I sometimes feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but this has sort of been my issue through this entire water rate study one of my issues. 
um, which is, and Catherine showed a slide about this. Um, I think it was the May 20th ad hoc meeting. Her last slide had to do with uh, the water rates and the fact that we are collecting 65% of our base water rates from our residential customers who use 50% of our water. And we're collecting less than 9% from our industrial customers who use 21% of our water. And the theory here is that the, the system has to be ready to serve. So if the residential customers wanted to run their spigots all day long and increase their water consumption by 30%, we'd be ready to serve them. I think that that's, in this small town, it's kind of an absurd premise for us to move forward. Um, we'd either have to do that or the town would have to grow and we'd have to increase the residential population by 30% in the five-year period. And I, I think both of those are kind of implausible. On the other hand, we have a list of customers that we have contracted to provide them with 30% of our water. Now, to me, that is ready to serve. If, we, if they turn on their spigots, we have told them we will provide them that much water. So I, I would like to see one more model where after Catherine functionalizes all the costs, instead of dividing everything among all of the customers based on meter size, that we create one category for the industrial and a separate category for everybody else, such that maybe 15 or 20 percent of those costs are being paid for by the industrial category or going through your meter equivalency into the industrial category, and the rest of it is going to the, to the other um, users. I, I would like to see if it makes a significant difference. I, I don't know that it does, but I think that there's actual reason to test it based on how we know our system is in fact being used and how it potentially can be used. I, I don't know if I, I agree with that. Council. I think that that's an excellent idea. Are the, uh, are the assumptions that uh, Council Member Koberstein correct in, in the, opinion, uh, the opinions you made? I, I'm, she made a statement. I'm wondering if it makes sense. Is that what you presented in terms of the, the, the need to have, uh, to be ready to serve? Is that argument legitimate? So that's correct. I think there's two, there's two points I'd like to make with regard to this. Um, the first is that the cost that is spread amongst the, uh, according to the meter size, that's tw about 21 percent of the total cost that's being that's being allocated that way. So it's not at all of the cost by any means. It's about 21 percent. The other one is that uh, it is the rate study is based on cost of service. It follows the what we consider the, the Bible of uh, best best uh, practices, which is the M1 manual from American Water Works Association. And uh, this is the methodology that is um, that is touted to do to do. Um, and if if more if you put more costs into the base portion, you would exaggerate this problem. That, if it's if it's considered a problem, um, but your rate study, the way it's uh, structured right now, you're collecting about 30% of the costs in the base, which includes the customer cost and the capacity cost. And the piece that um, Councilmember Koberstein is talking about is just that capacity piece. So that's why I say it's about 21% because the remaining 9% is just customer cost. And that's things like the utility billing department, uh, reading meters, sending out um, um, notices and sending out bills and collecting um, money and those types of tasks. Um, so just to kind of put that in perspective, does that help? Yeah, does the fact that we have these contracts and, and we've committed ourselves to serving certain entities, does that play into your thinking? Does that... Does that um, argument makes sense to you that they would sh also share in that capacity cost? In other words, are we different? Is this community different than others th and we are outside of the typical model that you use? I, I don't think you're outside of the typical model. Okay. Um, no. 
I mean, most most cities have contracts with other users, correct? Where they have to, where they're contractually obligated to serve, and I assume there's a cost built into that. There's some cost to have that, correct? Yes. And are we capturing are we capturing that cost here? I mean, that's the question. I think that's what she's saying. I think that's we, a great question, okay. and I don't think that I can fully answer that question because I know that the city does have a lot of contracts. When we started out the process, the city was uh, researching all of those. I seem to remember a huge binder about this size that yep. Jennifer Tool showed you. Right. Um, and it was an enormous question, and that did not get um, that did not get integrated in with the rate study. And I'm I, I don't, that's sort of outside of my purview because I don't have access to that information. Yeah, I, I understand the traditional methodology, but I think what is what is different here is that we have like 25 some hundred customer accounts and we have 21 of them that are using 21% of our water. And I don't know that you're going to find a lot of similar things, uh, similar cities where you've got that. And so I think that the accepted methodology of this uh, meter equivalency is not taking that into account. And that's why I would separate out either the, either the industrial class or separate out the users who are on the water contract list. We have some hotels on there um, and we have some educational uh, and so perhaps what you do is you separate out those water customers and you um, figure out their own base rates as compared to everybody else. My guess, my, my only question is whether this is uh, doable. Is it doable to, to run a, to run a uh, spreadsheet like that? Can you work with Ms. Mitz and get the uh, spreadsheet information? It's all on a spreadsheet. Uh, so it's not that hard to, um, to, to, to capture what the uh, contract limitations are for those uh, wineries and uh, uh, hotels and uh, the educational institution. That's basically I, what you're talking about is 21 customers. It sounds to me like a very large undertaking, and I think that's why when Jennifer had those large binders. Jennifer Tool. Jennifer Tool. Um, that was something that was ongoing with the city and was really not something that we could get our arms around to incorporate in with the rate study. So what, you, what, what you're saying as a practical matter is that within the time frame that, that has been set out here, it's not really practical for you to try and run a model uh, as suggested by Councilmember Coberstein? Well, n not with that particular, um, correct, not with this particular schedule. I, you know, can I just say this? We have 21 customers. We th Their meter sizes are identified in the report. How many have a two-inch meter? How many have a six-inch meter? We don't, we don't need to know specifically who they are. And we can back off the hotels and the other people who are under contract. But it, it's, it doesn't take any additional work to take those 21 meters and run the um, equivalent meter analysis on those, on those 21 meters. We know exactly what they are. And I think it's at least worth a look to see if it makes a difference that the, a majority of the council thinks is significant. It's an option that I think we should look at. I think, in my opinion, if it's manageable, I think we should look at it too. I think, I think we need to look at our water as as a as an equity item, and we have to really look at it. If it was as if it were stacks of gold, you know, what, how would we look at that? We'd want to know. So, uh, I would be entering somewhat uncharted territory in that I'm not sure how I would defend that under a 218 type nexus. Okay. <laughs> we have actual data. I mean, a lot of 218 is based on the actual cost of service. We have actual data here on how much uh, over the norm uh, water these 21 customers are using. But how do we and, come up with that cost? How do we attribute a cost to that? I, I think based that, on our contractual uh, obligation that we made to them to serve them. But we still need to, we need we still need to have a formula for, for well, coming up the, with that overall cost. The way that formula works, I mean, what happens right now is 
I don't know what table it is in here. It's the functionalization. Catherine takes all the costs of uh, operating the system, and they get categorized in various categories. And one of those columns is capacity. Right. And you get to the bottom of that, and what she does now is she takes that total, those are dollars. She takes that total dollar number, and then she uh, divides it among all the meters, right. regardless of use category, based on the size of the meter, mm -hmm. with the residential being the one which all other equivalents are built off of. And what I'm suggesting is when you get to the bottom of that column and she has run her figures and she has this capacity cost, what I'm suggesting is you take, say, 20% of that and you run your meter equivalency for the industrial, you spread that among the 21 industrial meters and you take the balance of it and you spread it among everybody else. The cost figures are there. And where did you come up with the 20% is my, my question. 21% That's use. supportable under we the have, law. <laughs> you know, we have like 30, it, it could be 15, it could be 18. Right now it's, you know, what, what the split is, is really, I think the residential is somewhat subsidizing. And I, I think we could, you could run it at 15%, you could run it at 20. I, it just, uh, I think it's an interesting thing that we should look at and see if it makes a difference. Isn't it true that, uh, I mean, even though we have, uh, contracts that say that they can use up to a certain amount. When we go into our phase one, phase two, phase three water um, restrictions, that re those restrictions are across the board. It doesn't mean that those contracts get to use all the way up to their cap during those times. They're under the same restrictions as everybody else. So it's not that... <clears throat> that those customers get to use at any given time, well, during our water restrictions, and I think that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're talking about is, as the, it's a cap, but they're also under the same restrictions as everybody else. I, 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 when, when you have a, a restriction period, the residents are cutting back too. Everybody is cutting back. You're cutting back the, the same, same whether you've got a contract or not. I've got a point to, the, uh, to that, is that if you have a contract with a cap, the cap kind of works both ways. It's a cap for how much you can use, but it's also, in a sense, an obligation that we have. As you say, if, if we go into restrictions, everybody reduces. But if, if, if going over the cap is punished by a fine, and that fine can be absorbed as a cost part of the cost of business uh, does it is it does it not serve as a, a distance I don't want to get confused here if 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 the fine can be included in the as part of the cost of business it's not a disincentive so we've seen this in some other businesses where they they violate they can violate a rule pay a fine and 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 their business model can absorb that and they can still make make their money so is if how we limit that cap I think we have to look at because there may be a vulnerability there too that that somebody could say hey that's we paid the fine that's the cost of doing business but we were able to get more water I think we have to look at that at some point probably not right now with this but I see that as another vulnerability look I don't have any difficulty with running a model if you can do it uh, uh, <laughs> But yeah, if you can't do it and it's not manageable uh, within the time frame we have, then it's not practical. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, I would also uh, want, certainly, uh, uh, a legal opinion that we're not violating 218 uh, uh, by going down this route. Uh, and I must say that at this point, uh, I can't remember uh, the uh, contracts and the contract, the, the wording of the contracts with our industrial customers sufficiently precisely, but in terms of whether they are clear that we cannot perhaps carve them out and make a specific category with respect to them contractually, but we have to treat them in a broad class. There may be contractual language uh, in the contracts that, that affects this type of analysis as well. I just don't know the answer to that. That would have to be looked at by the by the city attorney. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe there is. It just, it basically, the ones I've read that are online, they pay the rate that is established by the city. 
and if the city ch chooses to develop a rate schedule and we take this actual fact that we know exists in this community and we take it into account uh, in setting the schedule, they're paying the rates. And um, you may well I would say we should you know, proceed and get the analysis. We may decide it's worthless and it does nothing, but I think we should look at it before we make a, a final decision. Well. And it's it's not a difficult matter. There are 21 identifiable meters by size. It's merely a matter of taking that bottom dollar figure and pushing it across those 21 meters based on the meter equivalency standard standard uh, data crunching. Well, I guess my view of it would be if you can take a crack at it, uh, uh, great. Me. No. <laughs> I guess I, I, I'm not sure how to take a crack at it. I mean, like I said, I'd be, I would certainly be going into uncharted territory with it. Um, but if you're all comfortable with that, then we'll take council direction. Uncharted. <laughs> Ms. Metz, do you have anything further? Or Mr. I Pressley? think my question to Catherine is, how soon would you need the information from us to be able to still maintain the same timeline? I feel like that might be a, a difficult point. On I mean, I know the information is in the report. The report lists customers by use category, and it lists their meter size and how many meters there are of each size. We already have the information. Well, then I, I, then I think I need to um, have a description of what exactly it is. You know, maybe you could write down, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this, and tell me exactly what you want from me. All right. Uh, let's leave it to Ms. Koberstein, working through uh, the city manager, uh, to do exactly that and, uh, and uh, get it to you in the next uh, two or three days, uh, and okay. then we go from there. Uh, but... Uh, you know, there, certainly the spreadsheet, sh the spreadsheet should be readily available that show uh, who the customers are and what the limit, what the specific limitations are uh, uh, in their contracts. That's all, all readily available. Okay. Any, anything else? Just uh, one item, Mayor. I just want to confirm that the idea of a special meeting on September 18th will work for the council members. No, I didn't. This is a Monday. What days are the does the city League of Cities stuff? That, and that's that the prior that week. week. It would be the thirteenth, fourteenth, okay. and fifteenth. So this would before. be the following Monday. That's yeah, fine for me. It's fine for me. Yep. Okay. Thank it's you. Two, yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, that takes us to item ten point. Wait, wait, wait. Matt, uh, just at oh. the risk of hogging the microphone. Um, I would just request that in the information that we get on September 11th, it might be good to pull out a couple of test cases of um, individual businesses where our results cause problems that nobody anticipated. So that we've, uh, you know, done some checking of what this structure is actually going to do, say, to some of the small businesses downtown or, you know, just pick out some typical customers that were in the categories that led to a lot of discussion. I don't know if that's possible or not. Not, just, the, not by naming the customer, just the category. Just want to confirm with Catherine that that works, that that's doable as part of the analysis and timeline. I do think it is helpful to have examples of impacts on community. So besides the methodology examples of what this means for typical customers, commercial or residential. Um, would you be looking for the same kind of detail that we gave previously where we showed impacts to a restaurant or a car wash, that kind of impact? Yeah, I'm looking for that, um, you know, some of these uh, food-related issues that we had that led to a lot of consternation over wastewater. I'm just looking for some uh, look back at our results to see if we have addressed uh, some of those concerns. Mm -hmm. So we maybe pick, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to pick a business by name, but uh, pick pick a category. <laughs> I, I don't care, public, 
yeah, uh, you know. Are you just looking for wastewater or both? Well, yeah, I think just wastewater. I, it, I, on that issue, I didn't really hear people complaining about the water bill side. It was really the, the wastewater side. Okay. I, I'd like to see what the wastewater side does to Vineyard Valley, for instance. Um, yeah. And the we water do. side as well. And, you know, just a couple so that we do some kind of check before we plow ahead. Okay, good. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Hansford. Uh, Thank you. You're, Thank you. You're free to go. Uh, so uh, that takes us to uh, agenda item 10.2. Uh, discussion and council direction of the proposed facilities condition and needs assessment RFP. Uh, and uh, I guess this is Mr. Hausch. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council and the public. Uh, yeah, the item before the council tonight is a discussion and council direction on the proposed uh, facilities condition and needs assessment RFP. Uh, you'll recall on July 11th, the council approved a multi part motion directing staff to expand on the available information regarding city owned properties. Uh, one method requested by the council was to perform an evaluation of the existing city-owned buildings uh, to identify viable options for how to best pursue repair, replacement, and or combination of these facilities to best meet the needs of the city, uh, as well as provide estimates for the costs associated with each of these options. Uh, specifically, the approved motion directed staff to prepare an RFP to evaluate the present conditions and future requirements of the city, city's municipal properties and facilities, uh, the goal of this evaluation was to identify viable options for how to best pursue repair, replacement, relocation, and or combination of these facilities to best meet the needs of the organization and provide estimates to the costs associated with each of these options. Uh, the motion further directed staff to agendize an Adams Street property discussion item to provide updates to the council and public on the property, uh, and then also to appoint a temporary council subcommittee of two members um, to work with staff on the preparation of the facilities uh, condition and needs assessment RFP, determine a development timeline for this, identify areas for coordination, and consider options that arise from the RFP and financial reports. Uh, that presentation or update uh, has been added as a regular item to the council agenda. Uh, the subcommittee was created, consists of Commissioner Doring and Commissioner Koberstein. Uh, and so based on the, the remaining item in the motion, um, staff has drafted the attached request for proposals requesting uh, qualified consultants prepare a, a proposal for a comprehensive facilities condition and needs assessment. Um, the goal is to compile a comprehensive inventory of all city-owned buildings, identify their current conditions and deficiencies, evaluate the structural integrity and physical state of each building, uh, and it's intended to both assess the ability of each building of each of these buildings to serve the current needs of the city, analyze their current state and condition, and make recommendations regarding their adequacy, um, and then also identify whether they're being under or overutilized. Respondents are also asked or tasked with providing financial analysis, um, such as the current market values of these city-owned properties, and uh, estimate replacement and or renovation costs, f and project ongoing maintenance costs associated with them as well. And the proposal shall also include a suggestion of prioritizing uh, which of these properties need to be addressed first and a timeline for accommodating their recommended renovations, consolidation, or replacement. And so staff has uh, prepared that RFP. The uh, list of the properties is attached. And we're requesting council in input on the scope um, of both the RFP itself as well as the list of the properties. Um, there's been no direct fiscal impact on the general fund as a result of the preparation of this uh, RFP other than the staff time associated with uh, its preparation. Um, however, there obviously will be a direct cost associated with the facility condition and needs assessment itself. Uh, staff does not have a specific cost estimate for this at this time. We reviewed a similar comparison that was produced and conducted by the city of Stockton and there resulted in a 20 cents per square foot cost. However, um, staff cannot identify uh, whether this will be a ballpark cost for us, just given we don't know what kind of economies of scale they're able to achieve through their preparation. But that was a cost that they received. So the current scope of the analysis includes 108,000 square feet. 
uh, within the draft RFP, and that would result in a cost of twenty-one thousand dollars, or approximately twenty-two thousand um, dollars, which would be a great par great price, I think. But I'm not sure that that's accurate. Um, and it's, it's further worth noting that that square footage also includes the entire square footage of Lyman Park, which is close to an acre. And so um, we did include that site uh, just because it's uh, proximity to City Hall. It's essentially integrated as a City Hall police station uh, amenity. And then also there are restrooms and the gazebo structure located within Lyman Park. That is the only park that was included. However, there were some other structures uh, throughout the city, including some on-park sites. So we're looking for direction from the council regarding the uh, proposed RFP regarding its scope and implementation. There's a timeline in that RFP regarding uh, when we're hoping to get people's responses. Uh, and it's worth noting staff, uh, and I believe the council received a, a comment letter um, requesting additional elements be included in the scope of work. Uh, staff has reviewed it, doesn't have any specific direction uh, regarding that, and we'll just be uh, open to council suggestions regarding that as well. Okay. All right. Any initial questions uh, from city council before I open up public comment? I just would like to know what were from the letter. I, I didn't see it. So uh, does it, what does it, oh, uh, okay. I can read that. That's fine. Thank you. All right, let me open it up to public comment uh, before we get back to council discussion. Yes, please. Thanks. Uh, no, I'm Ann Carr, Dean York Lane, St. Helena. I had a question uh, on item number three on the RFP. Um, when you refer to the team, who's on the team? So uh, I, item number three on this list, is a, this is the comment letter. <clears throat> so it, it identifies a uh, request of an inclusion of a highly qualified real estate appraiser in the list of professionals that should be included on the team. The team is the respondents to the RFP. So um, staff is anticipating this could be conducted by a variety of different um, organizations. There are some organizations that specialize in doing this kind of work. So they do these type of facilities assessments. Um, there are other groups who are, and they may have everyone in-house to do it. So an appraiser, an architect, you know, those types of things. Other firms that may respond to this are architecture firms that do forensic architecture, so they go in and evaluate structures. And then they may subcontract out with a, a um, appraiser to provide the um, appraisal information. So the comment letter was saying the RFP should specify that appraisers uh, in on the team. Um, however, staff does not, the current draft states it anticipated that the consultant team will be an interdisciplinary team, potentially involving multiple firms, likely to include a California licensed civil structural engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and architect as appropriate. So the current draft leaves the team open to definition based on um, the individual firms that choose to reply. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Any? And that's on page uh, 108 of the packet, if anybody's interested. No problem. <laughs> Yes. Glenn Smith, the other half of the uh, Dean York <laughs> Lane contingent. Um, I want to comment that I am really pleased to see the 2009 study listed here. And I just want to make this one observation, and that is that we seem to be playing this from time to time as though it's a $50 million deal with Adam Street or it's nothing. And uh, when, and because so many of the comments that are in the Star or at this meeting uh, are opposed to a hotel, opposed to development, it sounds like people want to do nothing. But in the 2009 study, I think it's a beautiful example that when specific ideas are put in front of the public, uh, for uh, public-based use, they respond really, really well. And of the three proposals that were in the 2009 study, they did not uh, endorse the least of those proposals. They wanted something that was in between the two higher uh, value proposals. And so uh, I do hope that that can be looked upon not as the you know a, a, a stake in the ground alternative, but as an indication that the public could well be open to ideas that combine uh, public use and commercial use. We all know that you need money, 
but the public would like to think that there's some value in all of this for themselves as well. So thank you. Thank you. For the sake of those of us who didn't run the staff report, my, my cat took a nap on my keyboard, and my keyboard is now um, in the repair shop, and I couldn't run the staff report. Could you just read down a quick list of what the buildings are? Sure. Just quickly. Thank you. So the current scope of the RFP includes City Hall and the police station, including Lyman Park, uh, the fire station, the public library, uh, Public Works Corporation Yard, the Scouts Hall, which is at 1530 Railroad, for those who don't know, it's directly adjacent to the fire department. Uh, the former CDF office building that the city owns, which is on the same property as the Teen Center. The Carnegie Building, the Teen Center building itself. The Head Start Building, which is a small building located on Crane Park. Uh, and Signorelli Barn. So that's the scope. Yeah, um, please, uh, Mr. One of the assets that's always fascinated me is the this, Lower this is Reservoir. Former Mayor Smith. Oh, I'm sorry, Lowell Smith. <laughs> always fascinated me is the Lower Reservoir. Um, with property values in Napa Valley sky high, I can envision some real value there. And it's all memory, so I'm uh, hazy, but I understand at that time, because we've walked around it many times, there's property up above there that would overlook that reservoir, etc. Things like that. Uh, of course, out on Spring, well, there was a city-owned uh, house that city manager used to live in. I, I don't know if we still own that, but there's a number of pieces of property in my mind, and the lower uh, below the reservoir, there's three or four big pieces. So I don't know if those have been included. It sounds like some of the odd pieces of property that may have substantial value haven't been included in this analysis. Is that fair to say? Well, okay. Uh, the the uh, <coughs> any further public comment? All right. Let me close the public comment. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, in connection w with the water fund, we've asked staff, I think, in the past at some point to look at uh, possible uh, subdivision of parcels at Bell Canyon. Uh, I must say that uh, until I heard former Mayor Smith, it had not occurred to me that uh, there might be some parcels around uh, Lower Reservoir, although my belief is uh, that uh, in our general plan uh, that that land really is identified uh, as a potential future uh, city park. That's correct. All right. At, out of curiosity, um, is it is is that land around the lower reservoir? Is that a part of the water enterprise? The the answer to that would be almost certainly yes. Okay, and then how much land is there? Does is there? I don't have that time. So um, the direction from the staff was, or the, from the council was to look at our facilities. So not not to evaluate all city-owned properties to appraise them of their values, but more identify uh, how our current facilities are being used. <clears throat> meaning primarily buildings, um, the state of them, are they in significant disrepair, is there significant costs associated with upgrading them to current ADA standards, electrical uh, and uh, heating standards, those types of things. So it wasn't a, the direction from the council was not to perform a overall assessment of every city owned property, it was more to understand um, how our existing structures are utilized, their current state, and the cost to maintain them, and then also if we are under over over utilizing them. And I don't want to speak for the council, but that's yeah, generally the summary that staff understood. Yeah, I, think I think we also talked about prioritizing things. We recognize that we have other city assets, um, and that um, this requires a specific team of people to do and that some of these other um, properties are not going to be left out of the ultimate consideration of what our assets are and what they're worth. It's just that, um, for instance, we might proceed to the parks, the rest of the parks second, but that w what we were doing was focusing on properties that had uh, physical facilities sitting on them. Uh, I would like the staff to address uh, why it is, wh whether it perceives any difference between best used and highest and best use. Uh, what, what's the intent with respect to best use, highest and best use? 
Uh, I, I would typically identify highest and best use as a market-driven uh, value or terminology, whereas best use could be utilized uh, from a municipal perspective, ir irregardless of what the market may say. Okay. I, I must say it does seem to me then that, that, that both of those should be included uh, and that perhaps we should consider specifying appraiser among the list of uh, folks that uh, that uh, that uh, would be um, included and then just uh, one quick comment on the RFP itself public records uh, under four I think uh, you committed uh, uh, you left out a knot which is something I occasionally do too uh, but it says perspective page 115 Thank you. Uh, prospective consultants are cautioned I think you mean to say not to include any material into the proposal that is strictly proprietary in nature. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, any of that, uh, is there further council discussion? <clears throat> uh, I, I do agree that we, we uh, could benefit from a real estate appraiser uh, on the team. I would caution, though, that I, I, I don't think we're anticipating an appraisal of each of the properties that would be quite expensive, frankly, and I, I'm not sure, I, I want to make sure that that's not what we're asking for, that we're, we're having somebody evaluate, giving their best uh, estimates and not a full-blown appraise, appraisal for each of the properties. That's a very that's important totally distinction to make. Uh, yeah. So okay. staff has requested a bid for an appraisal of, I, I can't remember which, but I think it was the um, office building. Or teen center property, and that came in at thirty-five hundred dollars for one property. So just to be aware, that is an important distinction to make. Thirty-five hundred or thirty. Thirty-five hundred. Thirty-five for one property to be appraised. Oh, oh, I see. For the oh, okay, not the <laughs> not the entire not the thing. value, just the just the. Uh, I would say that's a value too. I think that that these prices can go up into the tens and fifteen thousand dollars easily mm -hmm. for some of these properties. Are we? I would like to what make a comment that, uh, I mean, I was at a Parks and Rec meeting last night, and, and of course, Parks and Rec Commission felt uh, that if we were going to do a needs assessment, uh, parks, all parks should be included in it, and of course, all of our roads and sidewalks should be included in it to see what um, monies are actually needed to rebuild all of our um, assets and roads and sidewalks. Um, I understand that that would be quite an undertaking under this RFP, but I would like to see that very soon. And to really get a handle on what the city needs moving forward uh, for, for the future before everything falls apart so which it already is I don't know uh, I cannot recall at this point in time when it was that we last uh, did a thorough assessment of uh, the cost of dealing with our roads and sidewalks uh, 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 Could you remember I'm, and we don't have obviously public works director uh, Smithies right. Ahmed Smithies here. I do remember she she had identified a number for all the roads. I don't believe it included sidewalks, but it, it was it was a substantial number that was she she voiced at a previous meeting. Yeah, it was a it was a large number, and I don't know whether it. I really can't recall at this point whether it inclu just what it included. Whether it included uh, all of our roads. Uh, 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 I just don't remember at this point. I think it was based on the pavement index, so it would yeah. not have included sidewalks, but. Okay. Mayor, uh, just to address uh, the vice mayor's comments, I believe the staff can independently uh, put an order of magnitude figure together for both parks and wish lists related to parks, as well as sidewalks and streets. Uh, so we probably have some pretty good data there that could complement that just uh, with an eye on trying to keep the the scope right. focused here and and uh, contain the cost okay yeah I mean I do think that uh, that a responsible response to this uh, RFP is going to be costly <laughs> nothing like that uh, city of Stockton number which uh, 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 
perhaps re reflects, probably does reflect a very different uh, facility scenario that they have than as opposed to us. So, any further council discussion? And I think. Uh, Where do we stand on this list that we got? Are we. Oh, is it. I mean, if there are specific ones that you wish to bring up. Uh, I think number one should be postponed. I, I don't think that that is really part of um, what we have asked, you know, what we're asking these people to do. Um, Possible I, sale of city owned properties. Yeah, that's, that's that, would, that would require a full appraisal, yeah, that's I would it. assume, of the city owned properties. What, that's correct. What is this that we're. This is a comment letter that was written by a concerned citizen. Okay. Um, who provided it uh, as a comment to this uh, project. Okay. Um, and, and I do want to say I absolutely agree with the visioning study uh, cost estimate, and also in part because all three of those uh, options included library expansion. And I think, you know, we're looking at the library. Um, one of the questions would be, does that expansion make sense and how much does it cost? When we're asking people to look at whether facilities are underutilized or bursting at the seams. So is that the, is the direction to incorporate valuing the cost of constructing the vision, the Adam Street 20, 2009 visioning study? I think we should at least, I, I, I would like to go back and um, look at it, but in the end, it kind of came down to one, there were three options, and it kind of came down to a preferred. Um, and I think we should look at that and see how it could be folded in here. Certainly the expansion of the library is a question we should answer if it's needed and what does it cost. It's part of assessing the library anyway. I don't remember every um, use that was in the, the final um, plan. Maybe it's something the staff could look at. And well certainly had a quite a number of components uh, to it as I recall it uh, I could rattle off a few of them right now if you right, I could rattle off <laughs> many of them as well uh, the, the difficulty with it was uh, that there was no financial plan right. uh, behind it uh, and we all have suffered from that since unfortunately uh, uh, but uh, 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 I think we may get at that that issue that you raised Mary indirectly when we look at the needs that we have Rather than library. focusing our attention on one property, I think if we look at an overall, uh, our overall circumstances, then we may be able to get to this issue um, as a consequence of the study. Mm -hmm. We'd be able to focus in on, uh, you know, City Hall. Well, maybe the City Hall would, would be part of that visioning study or, or other parts of it. So I think we need to do it this way, sort of the, it's a two-step process the way I look at it. We, we have to kind of assess w where we are. The, then the second step would be to strategize about how we combine properties, how we may develop properties, potentially sell properties. And then I think that that may come in that part of, of our analysis. In my mind, I think that's, that would be the better practice rather than focusing in on this one, one property. I agree. Right. All right. I there. think staff has the direction it needs at this point. Just a brief comment on timeline. Uh, we did run numbers and, and made some educated guesses about how quickly something like this can turn around and, and be brought back. I think the most aggressive possible schedule, if all the planets aligned, would be December 12th. But uh, frankly, I think that's too ambitious. I think we're probably uh, honestly looking at early next year. Uh, so the timetable in this draft anticipates a uh, final draft due to the city on January 29th. So just um, so we're clear on the timing, we think the consultant probably will need the winter to final, uh, final the report that they're working on. And um, there may be some opportunities for integration with um, the public and community engagement in the uh, early new year too. All right, very good. Do you have the direction you need at this point? I believe so. What I heard was uh, identify that an appraiser should be included in the team. Yes. But not that we are asking for individual appraisals of each property. Right. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I think we are talking highest and best use without going to a full blown. I mean, it's kind of a term of art. Um, but without going to the full-blown appraisal. Okay. 
Uh, just for uh, clarification purposes, I, I I don't know where they are, but I saw a reference to wastewater and water that was in the uh, the RFP that should be taken out. I, I don't remember what page that is. I, we're not going to be studying that. Then I think that the uh, you had a reference in the introduction to our our current budget, and I believe that 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 figure that you use is is um, out of date slightly. You might want to update that. Thank you. Those are the, I don't know where those are, but I remember those being inaccurate. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Then that uh, takes us to well, I might get the right agenda here. <laughs> uh, well, ten point three city owned Adam Street property update receive oral report by staff. Is there anything new there at this point? Yes, so <clears throat> Briefly, uh, the subcommittee of the council, uh, Council Member Koberstein, Council Member Doring, and, and myself, and uh, the Public Works Director and Planning Director met uh, recently to talk about that specific issue. And uh, one of the outcomes of that discussion was uh, interest in having the city manager or the committee contact each of the proposers for Adam Street to touch base with them about not only the subcommittee's work uh, and work plan moving forward, um, but also to assess their level of interest in the property. And so uh, over the past week and a half, I have contacted each of the uh, proposers. Uh, they remain interested in the parcel. Uh, they understand that uh, uh, the city is going to go through a needs assessment RFP and that process takes time and uh, they've indicated a willingness to uh, be patient and uh, participate in that and, and watch that as it unfolds. Um, it's probably helpful also to indicate that the committee discussed um, a conceptual conceptual ideas related to a public engagement process uh, that would integrate the community into uh, discussions of not only needs uh, of the city moving forward but also that property in general um, and so we anticipate the staff will be in working with this subcommittee bringing forward um, maybe as early as September 12th um, but in the near term a conceptual recommendation related to how we engage the community uh, in these discussions moving forward. Good. All right. Uh, last item is wastewater treatment plant upgrade status. Can I do a on this? Oh, sure. I had a dream last night that I was able to do away with the Brown Act, but your, your dream is not going to come true, and neither is mine. Okay. I'm going to comment on a letter that the mayor wrote, rather pedantic letter, I might add, um, as a letter to the editor of the St. Helena Star. I think it is appropriate because I think it has to do with the Brown Act. Huh. Um, but I'm going to comment on some parts of the letter before I get to my point. He says... Um, I want us to thrive by us, I mean our community at large, including our many residents and in brackets, especially small business. And I certainly don't want to denigrate small business, but most small businesses in this town are not owned by people who live here and vote here and pay taxes here. Um, without doubt, the key to our future is our community decision with respect to the city-owned Adam Street property, the recent city appraisal, from a strictly financial perspective, as is appropriate from, from an appraisal. But the interesting thing is you got that appraisal, and I've heard from two of the city council members that you didn't believe it, that you didn't believe when they said that all three um, proposals were financially the same. Um, two of you up there don't believe that. So I'm skipping down toward the end of it. Um, also, a major community goal must be community resources behind housing that is affordable, especially to our incredibly dedicated city employees. You know, I've talked to several city employees, and none of them want to live here. They either own houses somewhere else, 
or they can, for the same amount of money, get a much nicer house in Napa, which suits their family needs. So, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, I think that's important, but I think we need to find out what city employees here uh, really want. Um, I'm going to skip down to the end, actually. Where the mayor describes, uh, I'll read the sentence. Uh, let me find the beginning of the sentence, kind of run on. Indeed, as mayor, I acknowledge that I cannot make a credible argu argument for new tax proposals, for example, more local sales tax or a property transfer tax. When our community has the ability, at least the time, to raise substantial public revenue through responsible development of our city-owned Adam Street property. I'm sorry, that wasn't the end. Okay. From a luxury hotel on the Adam Street property, which will be of substantial assistance in this regard. So the, the mayor is advocating for a luxury hotel on the Adam Street property. We got three proposals, and one of them was not for a luxury hotel. So the, major, the major, mayor is showing his hand and saying that he prefers one of the two proposals that involved a luxury hotel. And I think the mayor really needs to consider recusing himself from further discussion because he's already told us what he wants. All right. Thank you. Any further uh, public comment on that one? All right. Uh, last one would be wastewater treatment plant upgrade status. Mayor, I'm going to substitute on that tonight. Uh, the staff is working with the State Water Board on finalizing the delivery date milestones for additional studies, uh, final engineering, construction, and meeting the board's compliance for the wastewater treatment plant upgrades. The emergency work out at the plant uh, is now complete, and the chlorine lines are again operational, and there are no more levee leaks at this time. The initial soil study was completed earlier this month and will be submitted to the state for review. That study is going to define how many uh, groundwater monitoring wells should be installed, and we're anticipating that work will take place in September. And our new utility operation manager is now taking the lead on the irrigation upgrades at the plant and is working with our operators. We're anticipating being able to do that entirely in-house. Okay, great. All right. Any Public comment? Seeing none, uh, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everybody, so much for staying with us.